A Donald victory, what does that mean for me and you? I would suggest this is the most important event, more important than 9-11 itself, as being instrumental in turning us towards an end world scenario. And so we will explain why as we go along. This would have to be part of the comfortably numb experience, as I said previously. In every facet of life as we look, there are smoke screens and mirrors, perhaps except with engineering, where natural law has to be carried through, the instructions have to be followed, truth has to be followed for the bridge to be built, for the tunnel to be made. But in other areas of life, there is half-truths, which is the very nature of who man is. It was a surprise to find Ben Carson as one introducing the evangelicals to Donald Trump. It is from Time magazine, talking about the meeting back in June 2016. He says, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but use your brain, which God gave you. So this is reported from a tweet from a participant. The GOP political nominee had tripled down with the one base of political support that had steadfastly remained with him, and who were they? Was it the Russians? Was it to do with the FBI? Or was it the white evangelical voters? That it is, and that's what it states by promising to dismantle the laws that separate church and state in America. That should ring alarm bells. The very foundation of America was separation of church and state. The pilgrims, the refugees, had sailed from the old world to get away from the tyranny of church and state to a new land to find freedom. And so they made a new foundation Part of their strength is to do with this. We have the lamb-like beast, its horns representing its power is to do with republicanism and protestantism and it found freedom in this in the new land by a separation of church and state. Trump promised that one of his first efforts as president would be to dismantle laws that keep Christian churches from spending tax-exempt money on political advocacy. He promised to vigorously attack a law established in the 1950s from legislation sponsored by the then Senator Lyndon Johnson amending the US tax code rules that prevents tax-exempt organizations such as churches or educational institutions from endorsing political candidates. So this means that they could put money towards who they wanted to endorse. And so this would flow both ways. 
This is what he's going to deliver. And so, again, after the election, he says, February 10 of 2017, speaking at the National Prayer Breakfast last Thursday, President Donald Trump vowed to destroy the Johnson Amendment, which prevents houses of worship and other tax exempt organizations from engaging in political campaigning. The draft order for religious freedom drafted by the Trump administration in broad terms but specifically refers to organizations right to claim religious objections to same-sex marriage, abortion, transgender rights. You heard that coming up as an issue. He was asked about that concerning his own hotel chains, transgender rights, contraception and premarital sex. Well, an organisation such as a church, should they not be able to speak on who should be part of their membership to do with the rules that they put in place? But no, things were so intrusive concerning what was being put in place by the previous administrations that here we have a backflip in totally the diff in the total opposite direction but government is still in the midst of dictating to individuals what should happen it would require the Department of Justice to defend such religious freedom. The religious freedom draft states that protected organisations would include closely held for-profit corporations. Individuals and organisations would not forfeit their right for freedom when providing social services, educational health care, earning a living, seeking a job or employing others receiving government grants or contracts or otherwise participating in the marketplace, the public square or interfacing with federal, state or local governments. You see what had been put in place, the intrusion put in place under, continuing under the Obama administration now will be put into the hands of the conservative Christians. This was a draft of Trump religious freedom executive order signals a major win for conservative Christians from the Huffington Post uh, in February of this year that news article comes. How Donald Trump picked his running mate July 20 2016 the New York Times magazine Donald Trump Jr. reached out to a senior advisor to the governor John Kasich of Ohio who left his presidential race just a few weeks before. Did he have any interest in being the most powerful vice president in history? When Kasich's advisor asked how this would be the case, Donald Jr. explained that his father's vice president would be in charge of domestic and foreign policy. Then what, the advisor asked, would Trump be in charge of? Making America great again was the casual reply. Ultimately, Trump chose Governor Mike Pence of Indiana to be his running mate. Meanwhile, Trump's final choice for the job, Mike Pence, did not hail from the swing state or arrive with presidential campaign experience, as would be the case with Kasich. But he was a Republican and a governor and a popular amongst conservative evangelicals. Pence knows how to deal with Congress, whereas Trump does not. He has that political experience. On the face of it, it appears like good news. Religious liberty. But I would suggest, as we go along, that it is something that is not really as it appears to be. You know, Cardinal Dolan and I have some things in common. For instance, we both run impressive properties on Fifth Avenue. <laughs> of course, his is much more impressive than mine. That's because I built mine with my own beautifully formed hands. 
Well, his was built with the hands of God, and nobody can compete with God. Is that correct? Nobody, right? That's right. No, no contest. We can also agree on the need to stand up to anti-Catholic bias, to defend religious liberty, and to create a culture that celebrates life. America is in many ways divided. Thank you. America is in many ways divided like it's never been before. And the great religious leaders here tonight give us all an example that we can follow. So, establishing a government government-wide initiative to respect religious freedom is what is occurring but is it ultimately going to be about religious freedom as stated in the Constitution as was the foundation of America. Trump has delivered on the Supreme Court nomination of Neil Gorsuch, a young judge with a lot of time ahead of him in this important role a strong social conservative who has sided with religious conservatives in the law court. The appearance by Trump's Vice President Mike Pence encapsulates what Trump is representing, who describes himself as a Catholic, evangelical, born-again Christian, anti-abortion and religious liberty for Christians and priority for Christians in legislation such as for refugee status is what is at hand here. In history we have the Edict of Milan, Constantine the Great, where a compromise was used to allow religious freedom for Christians following intense persecution by pagan emperors and particularly the emperor who had brought Constantine up in his court Following the years of persecution, there was a meld of Christianity and paganism, sun worship and Christianity. Later this was followed by Emperor Justinian giving power to the church to persecute heretics. At the time it was the Arians. Later on it became others such as the Waldenses, the Huguenots and then the Protestants. The political church persecuted God's church and so there was the Dark Ages. The scenes of bloodshed in the name of Christ led to the French Revolution and so you've got this picture here of the Saint Bartholomew Massacre in which the King of France at that time gave safe guard to all those under his care but at midnight when the toll of the bell rang out. Thousands were slaughtered and in the in the Seine River blood ran as bodies were dumped into that river. And so we have this picture from the Zurich National Museum and it's placed there speaking about the migration that came from that country up into Switzerland for a safe haven and the Huguenots fled up into this country to get away from the persecution. And so following this turmoil that kept on occurring through uh, religious persecution, we had the French Revolution. This was a swing at that point in time from religion to a society that would live without a God. They worshipped at that time the goddess of reason. America's constitution was carefully crafted because this was a people who fled to the new world to escape the intolerance of the political churches and their persecution in the old world. This was the foundation of America itself. <laughs> Dr. Keenan Curie. We're on a journey to discover lost episodes from American history. 
And today, our search brings us to Washington, D.C., our nation's capital. And behind me is a wonderful monument to the third president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson, who is famous for many reasons, not the least of which is the fact that he drafted the Declaration of Independence. Jefferson was a master communicator through the written word. So powerful a writer was Mr. Jefferson that one phrase in one letter has become more significant than the Constitution in determining how religious freedom is perceived in America today. Does that sound strange? Well, the letter that trumps the Constitution is the subject of today's lost episode. What phrase in a letter could be that important? Well, it's the now infamous phrase, separation of church and state. When you listen to politicians, professors, and court cases, or talking heads on TV speaking about religion in public life, invariably you will hear, we must have separation of church and state. But wait a minute, isn't the phrase separation of church and state actually in our Constitution? Well, that's what Americans think, but those words are not in the Constitution. Those words only appear in one letter Jefferson wrote years after the fact. Unfortunately, the original intent of this phrase has been lost and even twisted beyond recognition. Let's go back to the year 1801, the first of Thomas Jefferson's presidency. The leaders of the Baptist Association of Danbury, Connecticut, wrote on October the 7th, 1801, appealing to Jefferson to protect their religious freedom from the more dominant denominations in the states where they lived. They were very concerned that the federal government might someday attempt to regulate, restrict, or even remove freedom of religious expression, as some of the state governments had already done. Jefferson understood their concern, as it was his own. He assured the Danbury Baptists they had nothing to fear from the federal government. In a carefully crafted letter that underwent several revisions, Jefferson replied on New Year's Day, 1802. Here's what he wrote. Believing with you that religion is a matter which solely lies between a man and his God, that he owes account to no other for his faith or his worship, that the legislative powers of government reach actions only and not opinions, I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people which declared that their legislature should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. At the core of Jefferson's convictions were ideas he cited in the very Declaration of Independence and were echoed in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Thomas Jefferson believed that God, not government, was the author and source of all of our rights. He states that in the very words inscribed on this monument. The God who gave us life gave us liberty. He also stated, and can the liberties of a nation be thought secure if we have lost the only firm basis, a conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are the gift of God, that they're not to be violated but with His wrath? Consequently, he also believed that government ought not to interfere with those rights. This was in direct answer to the Danbury Baptist concerns. Not to be violated, but without his wrath. I would suggest to you that they are about to be violated because it's been predicted. I'm going to speak about several sources, go on to talk about several sources in which it's clear in which these predictions are given. And also the main source, Revelation 13. It talks about a persecuting power, a lamb-like beast. How well does it fit the very description of what is happening here? It has two horns like a lamb, republicanism and protestantism. It has the persona of a lamb, but it speaks like a dragon. And except you receive the mark of the beast, you will not be able to buy and sell. Does America have that power? It has the power of the, the airwaves, of the internet, intrusion in law. It's come a long way and now the very constitution, the foundation, is at stake. And of these things which I've spoken of here, I could keep on going on and on. I've only really scratched the surface concerning what's being done to strip away that which was before and make way for this world global power that's been predicted. We're going to speak more about this.